V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, Todd. How are you doing? Hello there. I'm doing okay. How about yourself? I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I got more, more things going on than I'd like to have. Well, that is the case with me. That should be the case with all of us until we can no longer do anything. I agree. All right, keep keep moving. It's the best best medicine you can have. And uh, well, we've been having a little conversation about an accident that that uh, we pulled up that turned into quite an adventure. And this was an accident that I uh, looked at briefly a few years ago when it happened because it happened to a music celebrity uh, troy gentry of the group montgomery gentry was killed in a helicopter crash in september of 2017 and it was uh, one of these things where they were going to play at a venue and he was doing an observation flight with a helicopter pilot to look at the venue there was an issue with the helicopter and it crashed and as tragic as it was uh, it did give us an opportunity to uh, look at this in a different kind of light. Beyond the fact that we had a celebrity on board, we had several issues here which have reared their heads before in aviation and the investigations you've done in the past. And it even uh, called you to question uh, the findings of this investigation. So, you know, this was not one that happened while you were on the board, but certainly you're familiar with the board's process. And looking at this, I was scratching my head about the conclusions they came to. Well, one good thing about the report is they did go the extra mile and do some work in the laboratory to to explore the issues and, and well defined. And I find no fault with that at all. But my concern is that I've raised so many other times is that the board doesn't do enough to identify the maintenance involvement in these accidents that would al allow the FAA and others to focus in on the deficiencies that are in the maintenance arena and get them repaired, you know, get them corrective action across the board, not just for one, one facility. Yes, I mean, human, human failures are everywhere. We've, we've spent a tremendous amount of time and resources dealing with the human failures of pilots. But when it gets into the hangar, we don't spend hardly anything. I, I can remember my frustration years ago, trying to get even crumbs from the FAA's research money devoted to maintenance issues. You know, every year the FAA comes up with, with a program of their, their workload, what they're gonna work on throughout the year. And it, it's usually quite an extensive list, going 75, maybe even as many as 100 different issues. The maintenance issue is already always on the third page, you know, and they rarely have money to go beyond the first page. So we, we just never get any money thrown at the issues that uh, involve maintenance. They're going after all the, all the issues that involve the flight crews. Not that they shouldn't be but they should devote some of those resources to clean up the problems in the hangar. As we have seen over the years, it's quite a few. And this is a perfect example of it. So, 
So this particular flight, it was in a Schweitzer 269C helicopter, a two-seat helicopter, fairly common, used extensively by the U.S. Army over the years for training. And uh, they took off. They were flying for several minutes. And during that flight, the pilot was unable to control the engine RPM and turned the twist grip, no change in the engine RPM. And they figured out that in order to land this, that he was going to do a maneuver auto rotation to land it. And here's where it gets sort of interesting. This was a commercial helicopter pilot. He was an instructor pilot as well, had several hundred hours in this model. So he was, wasn't unfamiliar with the airport or the aircraft. So uh, when he had this issue, he had two options, either doing something called a power on approach to a run on landing or power off auto rotation landing. As it turns out, the manual for this aircraft did not have any specific emergency procedures for what to do with respect to uh, auto rotation. And the Army manual this was based on, which wasn't something he was required to know, but if he were an experienced pilot in this kind of aircraft, he likely would have known that this kind of information existed. It did have a procedure, and that was for a run on landing. And so he decided to do the auto rotation instead, and that's where things uh, went wrong for him. Yes, yes. You know, interesting about the procedures not being in this manual, it's also not in the manual for the two competing helicopters. So none of these, these uh, essentially small helicopters have a procedure for auto rotation in them. Although they practice it in training, uh, he, he uh, in his verbalization with the two uh, other pilots that were trying to talk him through his problem, uh, he mentioned that he uh, failed a run-on uh, landing sometime earlier, uh, but he had done uh, auto rotations before, so he was more comfortable doing an auto rotation. But having said that, they talked to him about making sure he did the auto rotation over the airport, which he did not do. He was near the airport when he uh, started that process, but he wasn't over the airport. And he was uh, ended up landing in the, an area of, of trees. And in short, when it comes to auto rotation, the spinning ro rotor blades actually provide lift for the helicopter. And without engine power, by descending, you're basically trading uh, you know, altitude for energy, and that energy is going to the rotors. It allows you to land in a controlled manner. For whatever reason, the rotational speed wasn't high enough. And in fact, one of the observers on the ground said it was so slow, he could see the individual rotor blades. And when that happened, there simply wasn't enough lift. And instead of having some sort of controlled forward motion, it was basically coming straight down. And toward the end, the uh, helicopter nosed over and hit the ground, and it was fatal to both occupants. Right, that auto rotation is is dependent upon how you select the collective, uh, so, which is the pitch of the rotor blades. You want it so it has maximum rotation of the of the rotor blades. So when you change the pitch to provide some lift, it's got momentum to keep those blades going. So he he definitely uh, failed to do the auto rotation properly because there was no way in heck that the uh, anybody on the ground should have seen the blades rotating that slowly. So he obviously messed up the collective, the use of the collective. So the end of the flight included an uncontrolled descent, but the reason for this descent was the problem with controlling the engine. And that gets back to the maintenance aspect of this. Um, this was a helicopter used in, uh, by a commercial operator that was using this for training and such. And the person who headed that operation was also the person who did a lot of the major maintenance on this on this helicopter, including the last several engine changes, and had been responsible for maintaining and installing the part that failed. And here's where the uh, report from the uh, technical analysis of the FAA came in, in to uh, well, put into focus what was going on here. And for those of you watching the video version of this, we're going to put one of the graphics from that report. It indicates that there was a part of it that should have been screwed in to a certain level. It was not. There were 15, I believe, threads that should have been uh, screwed all the way in. Only the first three were engaged. And from the wear pattern that was seen, 
it looks as though the other ones further in there were never engaged. That is, whenever this was first installed, it wasn't installed properly. And it wasn't like a very slight thing that's hard to see. Uh, the graphic we're, we're showing you now shows that when this was properly put together, it should be about five inches from one end to the other. And in fact, because it wasn't put in all the way, it was like five and a half inches. Now, as we said before, the owner of this flight operation was also the maintenance person who signed off on the maintenance and also approved the, the helicopter for flight, which brings into a whole bunch of uh, questions of, is there a conflict of interest where the person doing the maintenance is also the person who's okaying the aircraft as, as a whole for use in a commercial operation? Common sense says there is a conflict of interest, but the way things are approved by the FAA, there are some kinds of flight operations, such as this one, fairly small operation, where this kind of, of a situation is actually uh, okay with, with the FAA. And, you know, John, uh, I'm sure you have a couple of opinions about that, but this is a fairly common thing. This is not, you know, an unusual thing that you've never seen before. No, it's pretty common, actually. Uh, but human people, you know, hum humans make mistakes. And if you were doing an engine change in a one-man operation, and at the end of the engine change, the other one responsible for doing the inspection and returning it to service, you better put your, your, your uh, sensors on very sensitive to make sure you check everything because we are prone, all of us are prone to make mistakes. And in a bigger operation, they would require someone other than the person who did the work to do the inspections. Now, sometimes under, you know, even in an airline, sometimes when you're in a remote location uh, and you don't have an inspector, uh, they will let another person or the crew double check it. But it's, but it's, uh, it's pretty rare. I've been involved with a few of those. And every time you do it, you really need to redouble your efforts to make sure everything is right. And it was obvious for, uh, there could be a number of reasons, but this particular mechanic didn't follow the manual and didn't follow, you, follow the dimensions that they call out in the manual for adjusting this rod. It only has one adjustment on one end. They tell you that they want it to roughly five inches in length, and this was five and a half. There's only about uh, less than an inch worth of threads on the rod end. So he was all the way out to the end. Well, the report clearly shows it was only three threads in. I mean, even self-locking nuts, you want uh, enough thread coming out of the self-locking nut to keep it secure. And it was clear that this had been uh, working inside those three threads for a while. And the other visible cue that, uh, that upsets my stomach in this is that the jam nut that's required to be down on this, this, this uh, mechanism to keep it tight, keep it from vibrating, uh, was a half an inch away from where it should have been. So he never ran the jam nut down. And he went through a couple of inspections without seeing that. So that's just, it's clear, it's clear that the basic cause of this accident occurred in the hangar. And the NTSB did, did uh, the laboratories did a good job of ferreting out all the information that clearly shows that the cause of this accident was in the hangar. There's no mistake in it. It was clear to you that that was the case. And when I read the report and the background information in the public docket, it was clear to me that there was, well, the probable cause should have had some aspect of the pilot, some aspect of, of maintenance. But the actual probable cause finding, I'll read it verbatim. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable causes of this accident, accident to be the pilot's early entry into and failure to maintain rotor RPM during a forced landing auto rotation after performing an engine shutdown in flight, which resulted in an uncontrolled descent. Contributing to the accident was a failure of maintenance personnel to properly rig the throttle control tie rod assembly, which resulted in an in-flight separation of the assembly and rendered control of engine RPM impossible. Now, I looked at that and I thought to myself, 
okay, if one didn't happen, the other wouldn't have had an effect. That is, if the pilot had done another procedure and landed, the fact that the engine was uh, a tie rod assembly had that issue wouldn't be at issue. But if the maintenance had been done properly, had this been put together as required, it's highly unlikely the pilot would have been put in this situation. So why, in my question was, why do you have it as the pilot having a probable cause, but it's only a contributing cause when you're talking about the maintenance aspect of this? I, I think it should have been the other way around. And also the report clearly shows uh, the bias in the investigation portion of it. There is many, many pages talking about the pilot, his qualifications, uh, the auto rotation, uh, the run on landing, all the pieces that he had to do uh, because of the problem caused by a maintenance error. And there's barely one page of analysis of the mechanics failure. Now, how do we get anything beneficial into the maintenance community when we only have that kind of limited information? Granted, the lab did a yeoman's duty, the lab, NTSB laboratory, did a yeoman's duty in analyzing the threads, the wear pattern, and so on. So they did a lot of work on that. But it was really for naught because it doesn't, it doesn't raise to the level that gets people's attention. It's buried in the report. Oftentimes, we don't even have that much information for the maintenance side of it. But clearly, if we're going to improve the maintenance operations in aviation, especially general aviation, we need to have that detail on the first page, not the last page. In addition to the maintenance um, aspect of this, there are other aspects that were mentioned and implied, but they didn't go into detail. For example, the pilot was, that was recommended by two people on the ground to land it with a run-on landing. And he refused and said, no, I've done this before and it didn't work out well. I want to do it this way. Well, there's no discussion, no detail as to when that was. Was it with this aircraft and this operator? Was it somewhere in his training? Did the operator of, the, of this helicopter have any procedures or had a practice schedule in place where this uh, pilot who worked for him had to do this at a certain number of times per year to demonstrate proficiency? Or is this a proficiency thing that the pilot came up on his own but didn't document it? Again, uh, these are questions where if this pilot made certain decisions because of his past experience, what was the basis of that experience? No mention of that was made. Yeah, just to, another example of all the focus that was put on, on the pilot. And again, we get a one pager uh, for the maintenance side with no detailed analysis of why the mistake was made, no attempt to, to ferret out that part of it. So, now, As you said before, there, there are opportunities to talk about other aspects of it, but they weren't talked about. And I'm afraid that the average interested party who's going to see this report, and I'm sure there are some folks who will read the entire final report, uh, they might not get that much out of it. They will get a little bit more out of it if they go through the kind of detail with the public docket like we did. But even if they do that, they're kind of left hanging here. I mean, what's the best takeaway, in your opinion, that an operator or a pilot of a helicopter like this could take away from this report? Uh, the best takeaway would make sure that you more frequently practice your auto rotation and the run on landings. You know, I know the military uses run on, run on landings routinely, uh, but we don't see a lot of that in uh, commercial aviation. When I, when I worked for an FBO here in Boston, uh, we had a couple of helicopters based right there. And I used to watch them come and go all the time. And, uh, and occasionally I would see them do a run on landing just because of air traffic control issues because we were very close to the, to the runway. So if we're going to interfere with the runway operations, they wanted to get the helicopters in and out of the way as quickly as possible. So we'd watch it. But, you know, I don't know how often uh, pilots, helicopter pilots, uh, practice auto rotations and run on landings. But clearly, based on what this pilot had, 300 hours, and he only had one run on landing attempt 
which wasn't successful and doesn't talk about why or how it was unsuccessful. Did he actually damage the helicopter or did he have an instructor pilot with him who took over when he was attempting it and, and prevented damage? So it's not clear there. But in any event, there's just so much, so many pages devoted to this pilot and all these procedures in one page for the maintenance that actually caused the crash. Well, Todd, we talked about this accident a bit, quite a bit. So uh, I'll let you close out with the last word. You know, originally um, I wanted to do this particular accident in large part because it involved a celebrity that had a certain audience. And I thought, well, gee, if we talk about the circumstances of, of Troy Gentry's uh, death, maybe we'll attract a, a different audience. But after we talked about this, I think this is an entirely, well, let's put it this way. I think if that audience shows up, that's great. But I think there's a new audience I think should open up their eyes to this. Anyone who flies a helicopter, especially this model of helicopter, auto rotations are an emergency procedure that may happen to you in your career. If your manual that you use doesn't have a procedure, uh, there might come a situation where you have an engine failure or what have you, and you have to do something about that. Rather than making it up on the fly, or in this case, listening to someone who has insights, telling you to do it a certain way, and you think, well, I think I know better. Well, figure out a way to deal with a situation if it happens to you. It's unlikely. It's not something you want to have happen, engine failure, et cetera. But if it does happen, you have to deal with it. So as much as you can before you experience such an emergency, have a plan of action. Yes, and practice, practice, practice. Well, I'm still frustrated when I think about all the good work that that they did on this accident. And this was a this was a, a pretty well performed accident, but it's just unfortunate that the maintenance issues that could have been highlighted here are buried back in the public docket. And most people don't know, uh, and I hear it over and over and over again. Well, I got the NTSB report. Yes, we have the NTSB report. In that report, there's almost nothing for maintenance. We got the statement of the, per the mechanic owner uh, that worked on this airplane and several of his statements drive you right to the heart of the issue, but there's no, ex no expanding of that in, the, in the, what we used to call the blue cover report. It's now white, but it used to be all blue covered. You have to go back into the docket and people who pull up the docket are rare. They pull up the, the, the report and never go into the docket. So all that good work for naught because it's not gonna see the light of day in a way that's gonna help the maintenance community. And, and I looked for maintenance accidents often and I would have missed this one because of the way the report because I would have want myself would have went into the blue cover looking for the, the maintenance piece of it. And it's so once over lightly that I never would have pulled up the, the full docket and found just how much information was in there. So it's just, it's just unfortunate. And in uh, and, and my last word, I'll do it again. If you're gonna go flying, do a good pre-flight, both before you get to the airport I mean, pre-planning your flight before you get to the airport and after you get to the airport. When you're at the airport, do a very thorough pre-flight inspection of the airplane. You know, I don't know what the pre-flight on this particular one was, but if they had to open the panels to take a look for, in general for the uh, engine, it may have been very visible. I know in a number of helicopters that they do require uh, opening the panel. You're not going in there, but you're just looking around. And that fact that the jam nut was was a half an inch off where it should have been on the throttle, you might have, somebody that was uh, uh, familiar with the airplane might have picked that up. And after you get in your airplane, do a good cockpit check. And after takeoff, put that head on a swivel, look around, because we still have mid all over. So 
the bottom line is please fly safely. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe.